Now we are introducing our third speaker of this session. I'm going to see here, yes. And it's uh, Shravan Vashish. Yes. And uh, you were here last year and you gave a very entertaining talk. So we hope you will top it this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see here. So. I'm being recorded here, right? Yes. I have to be careful what I say. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you could introduce yourself. At yes. The so I'm Shravan Vasisht. Uh, I'm at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Uh, I'm technically a linguist, but I do a lot of other stuff as well. So you can think of me as a psychologist, if you like. Okay. So today I will talk about something that's very close to research in cognitive psychology, something related to language processing, cognitive processes, processes that happen when you're listening to or reading a sentence. Okay, so it's a very um, psychology type of subject. Uh, but uh, the real point of my talk really today is to demonstrate to you that understanding the statistical details of what you're doing can actually help you do the science. In linguistics and in psychology, there's a general belief that statistics is something that's on the side it's not really relevant for what we are doing when we are thinking about our research problem. What I'm trying to teach my students in linguistics and I hope uh, other people in other courses that I teach is that it's really part of the science. You can, th you can think about your problem in the statistical model that you're fitting. And in order to do that, you have to think about the underlying data generative process. What's generating the data that you are looking at or trying to analyze? So to start off the discussion, I want to talk about a very simple data generation process, which you have probably seen many times. You have simply uh, IID data, so uh, identically distributed and independent data being generated from, let's say, a log normal distribution. This kind of data shows up routinely in psychology, in reading time and in reaction time studies. You can see the distribution and example distribution here on the right. I've shown a box plot as well, along with uh, the density plot. So this kind of data turns up a lot in psychology. And this is the kind of data I want to talk about today. And now the real data that I'm showing you on the left-hand side here comes from a reading study where there are two conditions. The labels actually don't matter, so you don't pay attention to that. But pay attention to the fact that there are two separate conditions and we want to compare the means. That's a typical thing you want to do in psychology. right? We want to compare means from two conditions. And one funny thing that you notice is that there's a bigger spread on the right-hand side, uh, you know, on the left-hand plot, on the, the right, right, or right uh, box plot shows a bigger distribution than, uh, more spread out distribution than the left one. On the right-hand side, you see the same data on a log scale. You still see a slight spread in the data in one condition, but not in the other. So this is the kind of, oh, thank you, that's great. Yeah. Yes, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So this kind of spread, this kind of spread is actually very typical in, in, in psychology data and reading and reaction time. Okay? What we typically do when we see this kind of data is that we just delete all of them. <laughs> that's a typical response in all research that's done. Okay? If we actually want to see a difference between the two conditions, then we don't delete this. And we just compared the means. Okay? <laughs> that has the convenient effect that these extreme values will push up your mean. And so you will get a significant difference there. Okay? Ignoring the underlying generative process. Okay? All right. So one simple way to analyze this data would be to just fit a simple linear regression. You would have an intercept, you would have a slope, you have a, a binary coded uh, predictor could be coded plus half and minus half. So if you do that, what happens is that this beta one estimate, this number here, is the estimate of the difference in the two means on the log scale here. Okay. So this, this is a standard linear model that you could fit. Of course, it would be wrong in this kind of data because this is repeated measures data, classical psychology experiment, two conditions. Each subject is seeing multiple instances of the same data. You can't fit this. Uh, well, you can fit it, of course. Nothing will happen if you do it. It would just be wrong because the IID assumption, independent and identically distributed assumption is 
not there. And so the obvious solution, which has been discussed since the morning talk and the previous talk as well, is to use a hierarchical linear uh, model. And so what I'm showing you here is a way to write down a hierarchical linear model. Now I have j subjects and k items. And so I can have, uh, instead of in addition to the simple linear regression that I just showed you, I have two new things here. I have an intercept adjustment for subjects and an intercept adjustment for items. And what that does is that it adds two variance components into the, into the model. So earlier in the linear regression, we had only one. And now we have three. Okay. So this is a standard approach in psychology. We fit linear mixed models. Again, all we care about is whether the difference between the means is significant or not. That's the usual approach. Right? And uh, we could be done here. Okay. That's all we need to do. We can publish our paper as soon as we discover that this estimate of beta 1 is significantly different from 0. And in fact, in that data set that I just showed you, which was uh, produced by some researcher whose name I will not mention, uh, it was actually significant, and it was actually published. Okay. All right. So you could end the story there. Right? Okay, so that data set is really about reading processes as I mentioned. And the issue of interest in that data set, in the two conditions that we are comparing, is the reading time at a particular region in the sentence. Okay? So the original data set is on Chinese. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes explaining Chinese syntactic structure to you. So I'm going to use English. Okay? So this is a completely different example, but the basic principle is the same. Now, in psychology and sentence processing research, it is very well established that if you process a verb, like resign in this first sentence, you want to find out what the subject of that verb is in order to understand what that sentence means. Who resigned? It was the nurse who resigned. Okay? So you have to somehow access the nurse in memory You've seen this earlier in the sentence, and you have to connect these two things together. Okay? So one of the very robust results, one of the few robust and rep replicable results in psycholinguistics is that if you delay the appearance of the verb by interposing more material, here I put in a prepositional phrase, right? If I delay the appearance of the verb, I will spend more time reading this verb in this sentence than in this sentence. And one of the reasons that people have proposed is that the word nurse appears much further back in time, and so you tend to have forgotten it. So this is the decay theory of dependency completion in sentence processing. Okay? So the basic observation is that if you compare the reading time here versus here, you will find longer reading time in the B condition than in the A condition. Okay? So as I mentioned, one of the theories is this decay idea in working memory. And I made a little cartoon here, which was actually supposed to be animated, but I ended up showing you a PDF of my file, so I can't animate it. But the idea is, I mean, incredibly stupid, right? So, so the idea here is that, can you even see this? I can actually see this. Here. Anyhow, so this was supposed to be nurse. This was supposed to be resigned. Completing this dependency would be faster in the first sentence, in this first sentence, because the distance is shorter. And in the second sentence, it would be longer. The dependency completion time would be longer because it's more distant. That's all I wanted to show you. That's the decay story. Very uh, well-established theory. Lots of evidence from many different languages. So probably correct, OK, in some sense. But OK, so we can actually implement this idea as literally as a hierarchical linear model. Okay. So this theory can be basically seen as an underlying generative process for the data. Right? So here what I have is I've got my, the, the distance is now represented here. And I'm going to estimate the extra time it would take to complete the long distance dependency. And that would be my estimate of beta 1. Really, that's all the linear mixed model is going to do for us. It's going to give us uh, a way to think about this theory in statistical terms. And in fact, we could do such an analysis with this. And we would actually get a significant difference there. Okay. All right. But it turns out that there's actually competing theory to the decay model in, in the psychology literature. And this is the direct access model. This is a much more complex theory, also very well established. And this has been developed in the context of signal detection theory in cognitive psychology research. 
So the idea here is somewhat more complicated. What happens is, under this direct access model, at the verb, you try to access uh, the subject, and with some probability, 1 minus p, you manage to access that subject successfully. And it doesn't matter how far away that subject is. If it's close by, if you just saw it, let's go back to my example sentence. In this sentence, the verb is very close to the noun, and in this sentence, the verb is very distant. The amount of time it would take you to complete the dependency under the direct access model is going to be the same regardless of distance, if you successfully manage to access it. Okay? So decay doesn't play any role in the direct access model. So with some probability, you'll go down this path and succeed in retrieving the subject. But in s with some other probability, you will fail to retrieve initially. So you will, for some reason, you will have a failure to access, and you will re-attempt re an access of the subject. Okay? So there will be either an immediate success, success in retrieving the subject, or there's a failure followed by a reanalysis, and then a success. Okay? And in some trials, you will actually completely crash and burn and fail to access the subject. Okay? So there will be some trials like that. All right, much more complex theory okay, than the simple direct access model. So it turns out that this kind of, this kind of non-deterministic automaton that I'm showing you here can be thought of as a finite mixture model. Okay? And the interesting thing is that we can literally implement this underlying process as a statistical model and study whether it provides a better fit to the data, the data that I just showed you earlier. Okay. All right. So what's interesting about a mixture process is that the data will now be generated with some probability from this distribution and with some probability with, from this distribution. Okay, so there are two different distributions with two different means and two different variances. And some proportion of trials will be coming from this and some from this. So what I'm showing you here is a concrete example. Here is a distribution, a log normal, with some mean and variance. So these are high numbers corresponding to these two means and variances here. And here's another log normal with, a, uh, with the same mean. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. It's supposed to have a smaller mean and a smaller variance. Okay. So these are two different distributions. And if I mix these in some proportion, for example, if I have 25% of the data coming from here and 75 from here, then I'm going to get a mixture distribution that has this characteristic shape that I just showed you earlier. Okay. That weird skew in one direction could be the result of a mixture of two distributions. So now, if this uh, mixture process can be thought of as a direct access model, we can now estimate the proportions of the mixing distributions from the data. Okay? So my goal now is going to be to look at these two conditions, each of these two conditions, and figure out the underlying proportion of mixtures in this distribution and in this distribution. Okay? So there will be some proportion of data coming from a slow a distribution with a high mean and variance, and some proportion of data coming from another distribution with lower mean and variance. Okay? So that's really what I'm going to now do. I'm going to basically implement the direct access model as a finite mixture model with two components. It's a very simple problem, but it allows me to ask a question that I could not have asked if I was mechanically fitting linear mixed models as we do in psychology. All right, so that's the goal now. The goal is to figure out these proportions, mixing proportions, okay, from the data. So uh, what we did is that uh, we now uh, implement a model that generates this data. So I've got some proportion P1 generating data from a log normal uh, and from another log normal distribution. And, and I do this for both conditions. So there will be two separate proportions, P1 and P2, representing the slow access times. Okay? The slow events where you actually fail and try to reanalyze, those are the slow distribution times right? that are coming in some proportion. And they should ha happen in a larger proportion in this condition than this condition, resulting in this underlying 
uh, spread that you're seeing in one but not the other. So really my expectation is that the probability P1 of this mixing proportion should be higher than the probability P2, okay? That's where, that's my goal now, to find out if that's true. By the way, this, this idea, what did I do? Did I do something? I don't know. Hmm. And also the system will shut down in, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. Did that take too long with one slide? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, so, so this is where I'm going now, okay? I'm going to now try to estimate those parameters, right? So what I did was, I just simply literally wrote down the model that I just described to you in STEM. I wrote down the hierarchical linear model, and I wrote down the direct axis model, and I'm going to now, first of all, compare these two, uh, I, eventually I'm going to compare these two probabilities of the mixture distribution, okay? This is part of the beauty of STAN, that you can literally write down your underlying generative process for the data, what you think is happening from the data. Okay? It's a very powerful uh, language for expressing this idea. Okay, so my top research question here, my main research question is, which of the decay model and the direct access model characterizes the data better? That's my goal. I'm going to do this in four steps, okay? The first step will be to use fake data to validate my underlying, my STAN models, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to write some R code that will actually generate a mixture distribution, and I should be able to recover the parameters that I fixed as fixed values in my fake data, okay? That's my first step to make sure that my stand model is not producing garbage, okay? The second one would, second step would be to estimate the parameters of the mixture model from real data, right? The data I just showed you. And then I'm going to do a model comparison using Vetari's uh, leave one out cross-validation approach, okay? So that will be my model comparison step. But the last step is probably the most important. I'm going to reproduce that data with new subjects, and I'm going to again try to see if I can reproduce the same patterns that I see in the original data. For me, that is the most important step, because I want to establish whether I can reliably find the same pattern in completely new data. So these are the four steps I will walk you through now. So the first thing I do is validate the model using fake data. So what I do is I will generate fake data with fixed parameter values for the mixture distribution, and then I will plot the posterior distributions from the stand model and determine whether the two parameters lie within the 95% credible interval. And so what I'm showing you here are, I don't know if you can see this, but on the left-hand side is the proportion P1, on the right-hand side is the proportion P2. So this is the posterior distribution with 80% uh, credible intervals. And, or maybe 95, I forgot now what I used. Off is thing in an offset. I don't know some. I don't know some expert for now. So while, while she's trying to do this, I can tell you that you may remember that we had vertical lines in those two plots, and those are my true values in my fake data. And you can see that my, if you could see, you would see <laughs> that the this actually captured the true value. So my model is not complete garbage, okay? It's so if I repeatedly run this model on new fake data, what I noticed was that most of the times I was able to capture the true parameter within the distribution, okay? So I feel, I feel much more confident that my stand code actually does what it's supposed to do, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I did next, which I can keep going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that the next thing I did was that I now carried out model comparison between the hierarchical linear model and the mixture model. Now how do you do that? So remember the old days when we used to do ANOVA, likelihood ratio test between linear mixed model, the simpler model, or a more complex model. It's the basically the same idea, right? But what we really care about here is that... It's here? Okay. <laughs> okay. So 
here we go. So we have, uh, so yeah, right. I already told you that my model more or less uh, does the job of capturing the parameters. These are all the other parameters of the model, and it's not too bad, I think. It's okay. I managed to recover most of the parameters. Okay, so the next step is to, uh, well, not to do model comparison, but to actually estimate the parameters of the mixture probabilities. What you see here are the mixture probabilities in the distribution with the more spread out data. So this is the mixture probability uh, distribution. So the distribution of the, uh, the, the probability P1 in the slow distribution and the fast, uh, in the slow distribution in the more spread out, in the more spread out data. Here. This P1 here is what I'm looking at compared to P2 here. This number should be larger than this number. Okay? And so that's what we are seeing here. Um, this probability is larger than this probability. That's what I wanted to validate. This is the difference between the probabilities. Of course, you will notice that the zero line is over here. So this is not a very big difference. It's about 4%. Okay? So stati even statisticians ask me this question. Is it significant? I'm not interested in that question. I'm just trying to estimate the difference in the probabilities. I don't care. Okay. So if that's on your mind, my answer is I don't care. <laughs> so the, the interesting issue now is whether the hierarchical linear model and the, and the mixture model uh, have a difference in performance. Which one is better? Now one way we can think about performance here is in terms of predictive performance. How would they do with future data? Would they, which one would be able to predict the data better? Now, Vitari has developed very useful tools for doing model comparison here. I won't walk you through all the details here, but basically you can derive uh, a quantity called the expected log point-wise density, which gives you a measure of predictive accuracy. And higher ELPD implies better predictive performance. So what I'm showing you here is the difference in the ELPD uh, between the simple hierarchical linear model and the mixture model. And you can see that the mixture model actually performs better. This is the standard error here. Okay. So it's statistically significant. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so the next step that, uh, that we took was to generate completely new data from new subjects. This was kept, uh, gathered in Taiwan. The first study was done on mainland China. So that we had to change the character sets because they have a different, they use classical Chinese characters. And there again, what you see is that P1 is larger than P2, right, as expected. And again, this is the, the difference in the probability. It's about 4% again, just like in the original study. And again, the mixture model actually outperforms the hierarchical linear model. Okay, so the big point here is that these data could easily be delete, deleted the way people do it in the, in, in the psychology literature. But this data might actually have some useful information in it. I believe this more now because I could reproduce this pattern in completely new data again. Okay? And we have more studies, which I haven't show, talked about yet, uh, where we actually see the same sort of evidence for the direct access model. We see evidence for mixtures in the reading time data. So we are getting more and more confident with new data coming in with completely different designs showing uh, this kind of mixture distribution in the data, which is consistent with the direct access model. Okay? So deleting this data is probably a bad idea in this particular situation. Okay? All right, now uh, the full paper that spells out the story I just told you, you can look for, uh, you can read in this six page paper that I have on archive. It's going to appear in the COGSI conference in London this year. Um, right, so the, the big question was, is there, a, is there evidence for the direct access model over the decay model? And the answer seems to be a tentative yes, at least, from this Chinese data. Right? We have more evidence, as I mentioned, for the direct access model. This was presented at the Stancom conference. You can see the video, and uh, you can get the source code for everything that we presented. It's a much more sophisticated model done by my student. I'm not as good as him in programming, so my story is much simpler today. But he has done a much more complex analysis uh, with different data, uh, with source code. You can use it to play with the whole thing and to understand mixture modeling, and you can watch the talk as well. 
Okay, so having now talked about how great mixture models are, I want to still point out that the guys who actually develop stand code, they are very skeptical of everything that they do. Okay, so Michael Betanko, he uh, tweeted quite recently that friends don't let friends mi fit mixture models, at least not for problems that matter. Now, luckily for me, I work on completely useless, useless problems. <laughs> my, research has, my research has no relevance for society whatsoever. <laughs> so I have no hesitation in fitting uh, finite mixture models because I know nobody's going to die. Okay? <laughs> Nevertheless, what he's actually trying to say here is that you have to be very careful when you're fitting models. You have to validate your model. You have to check that the posteriors make sense that the chains are mixing properly. The previous talk was so great. It shows all the disasters that happen when you're fitting even simpler models than these. Mixture models get very dangerous, and so you have to spend some time studying what's happening in that model and understanding that it's actually doing what you think it's doing. Okay? For six component mixture models, you know, for the galaxy data in the mass library, this model will not work. You will run into trouble. Okay, so there you have to figure out how to reparameterize the model like the previous speaker said in order to make sure that uh, it actually gets you what you want. So that's what this tweet is actually all about. But I still want to uh, get across that statistics will not solve all your problems. Okay? Statistics is heavily overrated in my opinion. Right? So you should, you, should be a, you should behave like uh, Betanko and be more skeptical, skeptical about what you're doing. All right. So I know that none of you care about linguistics or psychology, or, what, or some of you care maybe, but most of you don't. But at least I hope I can convince you to take a look at STAND for Bayesian modeling. I think it's a very powerful framework because it expresses your scientific ideas as a generative process. That's the most important thing that you need to be able to uh, actually do science. Right? And so I guess I'll stop here. I should also mention that uh, we're teaching a one-day course in, in Tübingen on stand in case you want to turn up. Right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes.